Hello everyone, welcome back to Into Sports. I'm your host Evan. Today I'm talking NBA with Jake. You see him right next to me. And this is the kind of guy I bring on Jake. When I'm feeling rusty, I want to win a few easy debates. I'm here to cook him up today, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and Jake is coming off a three-month suspen- suspension from Into Sports for telling me to put the Wizards in the playoffs. So that's why you haven't seen him for about three months. But anyways, into the NBA, the Nets are 9-6 and six since trading for James Harden. But Jake, do you think they're, the Nets are the real threats to LeBron and the Lakers to win it all? Well, Evan, in my opinion, you have to be stupid to say the Nets are not a real threat to the Lakers. They have the three best ISO players in the game right now, Harden, KD, Kyrie. And the questions coming in to the big three is, will one of the players be able to take a step back, take a third role, play off ball? And that, that question has been answered. James Harden has taken that role and ran with it. Um, he's leading the league in assists. Um, and I think they're the favorites to come out of the East based on talent alone. And I think they're a tough matchup for the Lakers. The Lakers guards um, are having trouble defensively. Like uh, Schroeder, KCP are not the best defenders. Uh, Kyrie and Harden are going to have their way with uh, with those guards. And you already know KD is going to get his own. Uh, so my only questions come on the defensive end. And actually, those start with their coach, Steve Nash. It really doesn't seem like he has control of this team. Uh, he's leaving the decisions up to the players mostly, and I think that's a bad idea. Uh, I don't think sh- this should be a player-ran team. I think he needs to take authority, uh, load up some defensive schemes, get going. But I think they're easy favorites to come out of the East, no question. Jake, I, I, I don't think they're favorites to come out of the East, and I feel like you made my argument for me. Number one, Steve Nash, an inexperienced coach. I look around the East, I look at Brad Stevens in Boston. I look at Doc Rivers in Philadelphia. Two really great established top 10 coaches, top five maybe even. But the main question for me is on that defensive end. Jake, I can make the case, and you can't argue it, that the Nets are the eighth best team in the NBA. So let's say they're the number one offense, which I think is entirely possible. But let's also say they're the number 30 defense. So best offense, worst defense. And they have been the worst defense since they traded for James Harden. If we split the difference, that'd mean they're like the 15th best team. But let's weight offense so it's more important than defense. Let's bring them up. Let's say it's 2-1. to one. Let's make them the 8th best team. So they're the 8th best team. I don't see how you can make an argument for them as the 2nd best team or the 3rd best team. When you have on half, half the side of the court defense... You are literally the worst team in the NBA. And don't tell me, oh, all you need is offense. Because, Jake, the Mavericks had the highest offensive rating in the history of the league last year. And they lost in the first round. So I I, I don't see it with the Nets. To me, they're not the favorites to come out of the East. All right, let me start where you started. Talking about the head coaching situation. Steve Nash, obviously an inexperienced coach. Why don't you look to the left of his seat, Evan? Who's sitting next to him? What uh, coach is sitting next to him? Oh, is, uh, is it Nate, Nate McMillan? It's not Nate McMillan. Oh, Mike D'Antoni. Is, Mike uh, D'Antoni. It's Mike D'Antoni. Mike D'Antoni has coached some of the most prestigious teams in the league. Coach Steve Nash with the Phoenix Suns, seven seconds or less offense. Clearly, he's a good coach, but also he's a coach that's all about offense, right? Um, yeah. And to be honest, I think... I don't think that's a bad place for the Nets. I think if they fully embrace this uh, offense only and outscoring their teams, I think it's going to be very difficult for a team to beat them in a seven-game series. I don't see the Bucks beating them in a seven-game series. The Bucks don't have enough on offense even. Giannis is going to get his own. You know, who else do they have? Chris Middleton. I mean, yeah, he'll, he'll get his buckets. Drew Holiday, it's not enough to beat Kyrie, Harden, and Durant. Just in a pure shootout. Uh, the Bucks are obviously the better defensive team with defend uh, reigning defensive player of the year Giannis. But you have to uh, remember, KD has also made a defensive, uh, all-defensive team, right? So he's no bum of a defender. And the the points that they're giving up recently, like the huge 140-point games have been without KD on the floor, giving up careers high to like Jeremy Grant and other players. Like, I don't know, who is the other guy who dropped 40? I don't know, everyone's dropping 40 on the Nets. Regardless, that's kind of hurting my case, but regardless. Yes, if the is. Nets fully embrace their offense, no team is going to beat them four times out of a seven-game series. 
No team is going to consistently score 140 like the Nets can consistently score 140. It's not happening. That's why I think the Nets are the best because the Mavericks, sure, they had the highest rate of the offense of all time. And the Nets are just miles better than that. Now picture this. The Nets bring in a, a paint presence such as Drummond. Their defense rating is skyrocketing. And their offense isn't taking a hit either because everyone spaces the floor fine. So how are you going to tell me a team like the Bucks or the Sixers can take down a big three with a huge paint presence? It's not happening, especially with a seasoned coach on the sideline like D'Antoni. It's not going to happen. That's okay. why they're the favorites to come out of the East. On top of that, like I mentioned, they match up great with the Lakers. And I don't think the Lakers can put up 144 times, but we'll see. So, Jake, you mentioned Mike D'Antoni on the sideline. Number one. Let's remember, he was fired last year for a reason. His teams, throughout his tenure in Houston, were not good enough defensively. Because Jake, as we've seen, I don't care if you're the best offense in the history of basketball. If you can't defend, then you can't win a title. You look at the last 10 years. The worst defensive team to win a championship last 10 years was the Warriors. They ranked 16th in defense. Not bottom five, not 30th like the Nets are going to be. So you mentioned that the, the Bucks or the Sixers don't have enough offense to beat the Nets. Well, Jake, it's real easy to have offense when you're playing against the Nets because they will let you score. We saw the kind of effort DeAndre Jordan was putting forth a few nights ago, just giving up in the middle of the play. And, Jake, they're, they're not going to be able to acquire a quality defensive big or just a quality player in general at the deadline they have no draft picks they have no assets besides their big three so i don't know how they're going to get any better all right another point that i want to make you have to realize evan the nets big three has only been playing together for about 10 games all three on the court so this missing rotations and this poor defense it may not stay at 30 okay they may get to 20 could get into the teens and if they get into the teens, even 19, if they get to 20, no no other team has a shot at beating them. They come playoff time. No team's beating them four times if they're the 20th defensive rated team. So if they can get it higher than that, with chemistry, with time, with coaching, it's going to be a nightmare for other teams. So I don't know. I think all their problems can be solved over time um, just by learning the ropes, getting to know the players they're playing with, and uh, – relying on their coaches to set up a defensive program that'll help them come successful uh, or be successful come playoff time. But, but Jake, who are those coaches that are going to set forth the quote-unquote defensive program? Steve Nash wasn't much of a defender in his career. Mike D'Antoni was all offense, no defense. So who's the coach that's going to set up that quote-unquote defensive program? See, you know, that's a good question, Evan. I'm gonna be honest, but um, so so just just uh, I want to hear from you. Who are the who are the seven teams better than the Nets? Okay, well, I, just so using you're, using, that, you're using numbers, but I want to know what teams. Just like, using I want, that I want straightforward, teams. very simple, undeniable math. We see that they're mm -hmm. the eighth best. I think the Sixers are better. The Lakers are better. The Clippers are better. The Jazz, the, the Celtics. Jazz. So you named five teams just now. I think the Suns are in that discussion, although I think it's close. The discussion. Here we go. Now, I'm not a big fan yeah. of the Bucks come playoff time, so I'd probably put the net, the Nets as probably the sixth or seventh best team. And to me, that's not very threatening for the King and the Lakers who are going to repeat. All right. If you, you could take choose one of any of the big three players and take it off that team, and they're still at least the eighth best team in the league. Kyrie Harden, you want to take KD off? Kyrie Harden, that's a eighth best team in the league. That's an insane duo. Harden KD, even better. So I don't understand how you can say all three are at eight when even two of them would be an eight uh, AC team. Well, Jake, this goes or, sorry, back to my, a team in the league. This goes back to my problem with the Harden trade. You have three ISO players. There's no point of having three ISO players because. It's just one guy's going to dribble, 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 shoot with five seconds left on the shot clock, and they're just going to rotate. That doesn't do you any good. You need complementary pieces. You need Jarrett Allen. You need Karis LeVert. You need guys that can play defense. And that's why I don't like the Harden trade for them because I don't see the point in having a third big-time guy if it's just going to be dribble, 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 shoot with five seconds left on the clock. 
you do realize that that guy they traded for, James Harden, is now leading the league in assists, correct? Yeah, I mean, that's nice and he's all, like, but... He's not, he's not playing like a dribble, dribble, dribble guy this year. But that doesn't mean he can't go and get you a bucket at any given time. He can't drop 30. You can't double... Generally, KD, uh, Harden have seen double teams on, like almost every game in their career. So now you bring three guys together that consistently see double teams, and now you can't double team any of them because that leaves someone um, vulnerable, someone on the defensive end. So this this opens up so many more opportunities for the Nets. And you have a facilitator in Harden who can run the point or the shooting guard, and he can defend the post if they want to bring KD off, if they want to go small. I mean, Harden was, Harden's a great fit for them. Now they really just need to build chemistry and uh, – they need, I want to see them be able to defend guys like Giannis or LeBron, but like I said, I think that's going to come with time. Uh, yeah, good luck with that, and also good luck having James Harden be a post defender. Now, Jake, I'll grant you this. If they if they played with two basketballs on the court at one time, if the NBA just changed its rules to allow two balls on the court at one time, I would say the Nets are contenders. But they only allow one. You have three SO players. You don't need all of them. You need more defense. That's why I don't see the Nets – uh, being a uh, title contender against the Los Angeles Lakers. But Jake, I want to talk about Nikola Jokic because he is currently third in MVP odds. If you risk $100, you could win 450 in the betting market. Averaging 27 points per game, 11 boards, 9 assists. Do you think Jokic should be the MVP frontrunner? Yeah, I think it's clear that Jokic is the MVP front runner. His odds are amazing right now. I would take those odds. Um, listen, I wanna, I wanna hear, uh, I wanna hear your opinion on this topic first before I uh, go crazy and hit you with all my stats. This is the debate that I've been waiting for. So I, I, I would like you to start. Jake, you are making right now a borderline criminal offense. You are telling me. That someone other than LeBron James is the most valuable player in the NBA. Jake, let's be very, very clear. You think LeBron James is the greatest basketball player of all time. And let's also be clear. This is a good year for him, even for his standards. So, if LeBron James is the GOAT, but he's less valuable than Nikola Jokic? Can you explain that to me? Sure. So, Evan, you said LeBron is having a good year, even for LeBron standards, correct? Yes. Jokic is averaging more points, rebounds, assists, steals, shooting better from two-point percentage, shooting better from three-point percentage, has a better free throw percentage, and a higher PER. So, if LeBron is having a good standards for his career, and Jokic is dominating him in almost every statistical category, explain that to me. Explain how... Explain how LeBron should be the MVP frontrunner over Jokic. Not to mention, Jokic has a far inferior supporting cast to LeBron, and... Also, the Nuggets have finished last in the last two seasons, have finished third in the West and second in the West. So right now they're what, seventh in the West? You can you can expect them to, to climb their standings and uh be one of the top seeds in the West, which will put Jokic in contention for MVP. Not to mention his incredible numbers. So anyway, I don't know how, how you can even argue LeBron at this point. He's an amazing basketball player, but Jokic is just playing out of his mind right now and he'll continue to do that. Well, Jake, if Jokic is all this and all that, and he's so much better than LeBron at everything. Are, are, maybe is it time to say Nikola Jokic is the greatest basketball player of all time? Is, is that what you're getting at? LeBron has consistently delivered for years. This year, however, Jokic is playing better basketball than LeBron. The numbers say so. Just purely off numbers, they say so. Then you can look at his supporting cast. He does not have as good a team. Murray has been extremely inconsistent this year. Meanwhile, LeBron has a top five to seven player in the NBA. Is his co-star? He's got the reigning sixth man of the year. Uh, Nikola Jokic has a, a second year player, Michael Porter. Third, I mean, third year player. It's, it's, there's levels, Evan. And uh, LeBron's team is miles as better than Jokic's uh, supporting cast. And Jokic is still dragging them to the top of the standings. And he's still putting up insane numbers. Like I mentioned... LeBron leads him in blocks. That's the only major statistical category LeBron leads him is blocks. I don't understand how you can justify giving the MVP award to someone who leads uh, another player in blocks, and that's it. Not no no percentages, no points, no assists. LeBron is praised for his passing. 
Jokic is Jokic is uh, averaging far more assists than LeBron. I don't understand how you can give it to him. Even if LeBron finishes one or two seats higher in the standings, he's got AD on his side. Jokic should get the award this year. Okay, well, Jake, the problem is you say Jokic is driving them up the standings? He's driving them up to seventh place. That ain't very good. And you say if they there's a one or two differential in the standings? There's a five differential in the standings. The Lakers are 20 and 6. The Nuggets are 13 and 11. And then you start to mention that supporting cast. Jake, you know why you say the Lakers' supporting cast is better than the Nuggets? Because LeBron elevates his teammates. That's why he's in the finals year after year after year. And that's why you say he's the greatest basketball player of all time. He elevates his teammates, he makes them look a lot better than they are. You could say the exact same about Nikola Jokic, how he elevates his teammates. He finds teammates with easy buckets, easy, which rises their percentages, raises their points per game averages. Jokic makes the game so easy for the, uh, the players around him. And listen, on top of that, like I mentioned, it's early in the season, Evan. You, ha you can't expect the Nuggets to stay at the 7th seed. You can't expect the Mavericks to stay at the 13th seed. Things will, things will change in the West, okay? You can't expect the Jazz to remain number one seed. Things will change. It's early in the season. Teams are figuring themselves out. They're dealing with COVID issues, absences. Michael Porter's missed a lot of games. So, first of all, that's a blasphemous point. You can't say that just because they're seventh right now, they're going to remain seventh, and so, and so he can't contend for the MVP. Um, continuing on, Jokic, I mean, he's leading LeBron in every single category, every single one, except blocks. That's That's it. So if he's a third seed and he's leading LeBron in every single category and LeBron is a top one or two seed, there's no chance they give it to him. Not a chance. Um, also, <sighs> I mean, let me think here. Uh, let me think which point I want to which which point I want to bring up to you. LeBron is having his best three point shooting year, correct? Uh, of his career. Yeah. Of his career, and a and a center, a seven foot player is shooting better than him. And this is the guy you want to give the MVP to this year. Embarrassing. Embarrassing take. Well, uh, apparently he's elevating his teammates so much that he got them all the way up to a 13-11 and 11 record. Oh, I mean, that's just so incredible. Let's just crown him right now. Let's give him the MVP award because he made his horrible teammates who were in the Western Conference Finals last year. He took them to 13-11. and 11. Let's just give him the crown right now, right? He had a 52-point game where he notched double-digit rebounds, or sorry, double-digit assists, and they lost the game because they were they didn't have Jamal Murray. The rest, they didn't have a lot of other players. You can't pin it all down to their 13-11. They're not good. They're missing key pieces due to COVID, due to other reasons. Jokic put up 52 points and 11 rebounds, and or sorry, 11 assists, and they lost. That's that's an MVP performance. And his team, despite the fact that he elevates players, he doesn't even have the quality of player. To elevate to win to win those games. Meanwhile, LeBron is out here playing with Anthony Davis, who who has won playoff series by himself. What 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 uh player on the Nuggets has won a playoff series as the best player on the team? Paul Millsap is he still the same Paul Millsap that he that he was in Atlanta? No, Anthony Davis is better than the Anthony Davis he was in New Orleans, according to stats, according to to everything else we see. Yeah, hold on, Jake. You know why he's better? Cause he's playing with LeBron. You know, you know, he he won a single playoff series in his what seven years in New Orleans, and then his his first year in LA, he wins a championship. Can you explain that to does me? LeBron I can him on the you. Does, does his LeBron, name is elevate LeBron him on the defensive end? James. Does LeBron elevate him on the defensive end? Because he finished second in defense of the year voting last year. Defensive player of the year. Does LeBron elevate him on that end? No. And if he does, can you explain that to me? Okay, so so you just said LeBron does not elevate him on the defensive end. So LeBron is playing with the top two defensive player, uh, defensive player of the year candidate, and that's not due to LeBron. So that's that's on Anthony Davis's own, right? Who is Jokic playing with that is similar to that level? Okay, well, Jake, if defense is so important, then why do you like the Nets so much? Defense isn't really all that it, important, is it? Mm. Not it matters. It matters. Like I said, you you said that you made the point yourself. Nets are not going to win if they remain the thirtieth best team. Uh, 30th uh, defensive team in the league. It's not going to happen. But but strictly talking about the Jokic versus LeBron ordeal, Jokic 
is playing with far inferior players. His second best player is Jamal Murray. LeBron's is AD. Okay, they're they're that's not close. Jamal Murray is not even an All Star caliber player. AD is superstar. He's an All NBA first team type player. Okay, Jokic has put up a forty eight point game this season to go along with his fifty two point game. This is in twenty two games that he's done all this. And listen, if they Evan, if they don't make a top four seed, top three seed in the West, he's not gonna win. And I wouldn't be debating for him. But they are gonna make a top three seed, top four seed in the West. Okay, they've done it consistently for the past few years. Um, and Jokic is only getting better. The team is only getting better. Jamal Murray is only getting better. So what makes you think they're not going to be a top two or three seed or four seed in the next in this year? Well, because they're the seven seed right now. We're talking about who would win the games MVP into award the season? right now. And it's not We're even not close. even a third into the season. We're not even a third into the season. How can you say that just because they're five games back that they're not going to pick it up? Five games back from the first seed, from the Lakers. Because the Lakers are a much better team because they have the clear most valuable player in their sport. So, Jake, when LeBron goes to the finals once again and he win, 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 wins ring number five, you're going to think back and you're going to remember that you said Nikola Jokic was more valuable and you're simply going to laugh at your mistake because this is all-time prisoner of the moment type stuff from you. So let's move I think on. You're, I think you're a tad confused. Hold on, hold on. One, one last point. I think you're a tad confused because we're not debating who's going to win the ring this year. We're, gonna, we're debating who's going to win the MVP award. And clearly, because LeBron has the better supporting cast, he is the favorite to win the ring. Um, but anyway, fine. I digress. We can move on. All right, but if you switched the two teams, or if you switched LeBron and Jokic, That's, you wouldn't pick the Nuggets. Take, or you would pick the Nuggets. Take LeBron. Win, and you wouldn't pick the Lakers. Take, take LeBron off the Lakers, take uh, Jokic off the Nuggets. Nuggets are, like, competing for the first overall pick. The Lakers are a uh, playoff team. That, I mean, that's that's just the the purest, most simple argument you can make for the MVP. And everything points to Jokic. No, that's the most blasphemous without Jokic, argument without Jokic, you can make for MVP. Without Jokic, the Nuggets have less than less wins than the Timberwolves. They are the 15th seed in the West. Without LeBron, AD takes them to, I don't know, even, maybe one or two games back from uh, 500. I mean, I mean, is is most valuable play? It's clear. Jokic is more valuable to the Nuggets than LeBron is to the Lakers. Yeah, it's gonna be funny looking back at Jake saying Nikola Jokic mm -hmm. should be the MVP. But let's talk about the Wizards. They are six and sixteen, and Adrian Wojnarowski has said that if Bradley Beal were to be available, there would be a massive trade market for the Wizards guard. So should the Wizards be open to trading Bradley Beal? Uh, yeah, of course they should be open. The Wizards are in no man's land right now. They need to fully be in or out, and they need to fully be out. Because they're not going to win anything with Russell Westbrook and Bradley Beal as their core. Now, with that being said, what should they look for in return? I think they should look for expiring contracts and first-round compensation, first-round picks. So who's going to provide that to them, and uh, where would Beal be a good fit? And for me... Uh, my preferred destination is pair him up with uh, hopefully this year's MVP Nikola Jokic in Denver. Um, they should they would get in return Michael Porter, Gary Harris to match contracts and future first, maybe two future first or first in a pick swap because Michael Porter is a valuable player. Now, the Nuggets I think are one piece away from being real contenders in the West, um, and Bradley Beal is that piece. And the Wizards uh, need to rebuild. They get uh, a young player some of the biggest potential in the league with Michael Porter, first round picks. Uh, they get a huge contract off their books in Bradley Beal, and they get an expiring contract in Gary Harris coming in. Uh, I think all sides are happy in that deal. Yeah, Jake, I'm with you. I think the Wizards should trade Bradley Beal because, as you mentioned, they're in no man's land because it's better in the NBA to go 0-82 than 35-47. and you, it's, You're either all the way in or you're all the way out. And right now the Wizards are kind of in that 10 seed conversation. I know they're a little worse right now, but they're not as so bad that they get the number one pick. They haven't made the playoffs in years. So uh, they need to move on. And it's nice that they found a great player in Beal that's very patient and loyal to that organization. But you're not going anywhere with them. So it's time to move on. And... You said they should be looking for expiring contracts and picks. I think they should be looking for nice young players and picks. That's why I think the best team for Beal 
is the Pelicans. I look at a package with Lonzo Ball, Josh Hart, Jackson Hayes, a nice young big, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, another nice young guard, and three first-round picks. Now, if you're the Wizards, a lot of young players, a lot of picks, because you have to go into full rebuild mode. And if you're the Pelicans, you get a combination of Zion, Bradley Beal, and Brandon Ingram. That's a really, really nice young big three. So I think the Pelicans make the most sense. That is a very intriguing deal, actually. And my second destination for Bradley Beal, we've heard about it on the news. We've heard trade rumors all the time. It's going to be the Miami Heat. Uh, the Miami Heat have a lot of young pieces they can throw at the Wizards. I think the Wizards don't take a deal without Tyler Hero. Um, he's the best of the, the sophomore players for the Heat. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a deal package on Tyler Hero, Goran Dragic to match contracts, and then it's going to be a lot of pick compensation. I'm talking three three or four first-round picks. I think maybe three first-round picks, two pick swaps. Because um, as valuable as Tyler Hero is, um, an amazing shooter, uh, him and Dragic uh, are not going to be enough to bring Beal over. So he are going to have to be heavy on the pick compensation. Um, and then you pair Beal up with Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, that's a that's a huge uh, huge big three and the Heat uh, were in the title game last year, adding a score like Bradley Beal, the leading score in the NBA, will not hurt their chances. It'll give them some instant offense. Uh, definitely get over the hump and definitely um, get them through some rough patches in the game when they're struggling to score. Yeah, that of getting Beal if you're the Heat that would make you really scary, and if you're Washington, three first round picks. You know, I guess a competent young player with Tyler Hero. I guess that's probably the best thing I could say about him. So, I mean, that's fine. Um, so I think that does make sense for both sides. Definitely makes sense for the Heat, I would say. Because the Heat, they're kind of in a slump right now. They need to break out of it. And they have kind of a championship window with Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, add Beal to that. And I think that makes them arguably the favorites in the East are in that conversation to potentially go back to the finals. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a case where uh, the Wizards need to go out. Meanwhile, the Heat needs to go all in. Their championship window is now. Uh, Butler's getting older, and right now he's towards the, the back years of his prime. Bradley Beal would be a nice addition. However, moving on, uh, the 76ers, Evan. Contenders, favorites in the East? What do you think? Yeah, they're first in the East right now, and I think they are the favorites. They're 18-8, and eight, and I think a big addition for them has been Seth Curry. He is in the 50-50-100 club. So 50% from the field, 50% from three-ball land, and 100% from the free-throw line. This guy has been ultra-efficient, and you can laugh all, all you want since he's the younger brother of Steph, but... The Mavs have gotten significantly worse since they lost Seth Curry. The Sixers have got significantly better. I think he's a big-time impact player. And you might say, well, we've seen the Sixers the last few years. And they are good, but they're not great. But I look at two fundamental changes that is a big difference from prior years this year. Number one, Doc Rivers is their new coach, replacing Brett Brown. Brett Brown, potentially a little bit of a liability there. Doc Rivers, I believe, one of the 10 best coaches in basketball. Of course, won a championship with Boston. I think he's a really stellar coach. And then the other thing, which is something I've been saying for years, the Sixers need to have shooters surrounding two non-shooters in Embiid and Simmons. And they've done that. Daryl Morey, we know he likes to shoot the three ball. So he's their new general manager. Brings in Danny Green and Seth Curry. That really helps open up the court for Embiid and Simmons. So this is a Sixers team I really like because of these changes in the offseason, and I do think they are the favorites in the East. Yeah, uh, building off what you said, I've been really impressed with uh, the Sixers this year. I think they have the best defender in the NBA, Ben Simmons. He can guard one through five consistently. There's not many players you can ask to guard um, Damian Lillard one game and then guard Siakam the next game. Ben Simmons can do it all. I'm, I've been very happy with how he's been playing on the defensive end. Offensive end, you still have the same question marks that you've had in the past. 
but that's Ben Simmons for you. Um, and they have the best center in the East by miles. It's not even close. Uh, Joel Embiid is miles ahead of Bam Adebayo, both on the offensive and defensive sides of the basketball. I've been very happy with uh, the way he's been playing. Now, with any 76ers team, you have your question marks. Uh, the biggest two being one, can they stay healthy? Can they stay on the floor? We've seen their two best players, Ben Simmons and Embiid, struggle to stay on the floor come playoff time or just in general in the season. Embiid has uh, has suffered through chronic injuries. Simmons has had leg and knee injuries in the playoffs. Um, if they can stay healthy, uh, then yeah, they're serious. But uh, I don't know if they're the favorites. Um, and moving on, my second point that I was going to say is um, we've seen the same team with Jimmy Butler lose to a less talented team than the Nets or in, uh, even the Bucks or other teams that are in the East. Um, so that scares me a little bit. If they can't get it done with Jimmy Butler, what's to say they can get it done without him? Um, but yeah, I really love the uh, addition of Doc Rivers. It looks like he's getting the best out of the players, and I love the team construction this year. Seth Curry has been lighting it up. Uh, they're give, they're spacing um, the paint out for Embiid and Simmons to work, which is exactly what they needed to do. Tobias Harris is playing at an all-star level. Like I said, it's just health and come playoff time. Can they get it done? Do they have enough firepower in seven games to beat the the best the East has to offer? Personally, I say no. I think they are heavy contenders. I don't think they are the favorites. I like the Nets over them. Um, but I do like the Sixers in this series against, say, the Celtics or the Bucks. Um, but yeah, the heavy contenders, not the favorites. All right, so it sounds like you rank them second in the East. We talked about how the Nets don't play defense, so that's why I like Philly. And you did mention when they had Jimmy Butler. And yeah, I mean, Jimmy Butler is a great player and seems like they would be better with him. But ultimately, this is a completely different team. Embiid and Simmons are older, more mature, more experienced. MVP, or I mean, Joel Embiid, second in MVP odds right now. So he's having a big time year. And you just look at the shooting. That was their deficiency when Jimmy Butler was on their team. They've addressed that with Danny Green and Curry. So I do think the, these guys, the Sixers, are the favorites in the East over a team like Brooklyn or Boston. I would probably put Boston second, though, Brooklyn third. Uh, Jake, anything else to add? No, that's that's fair enough. I, uh, I think... The Sixers, definitely, uh, I think that's a fair rank for how they've been performing so far this season. Um, but Evan, something I want to ask you. Uh, we've heard some trade rumors buzzing around. Uh, Lowry sold his house in Toronto. It seems that Lowry may be on his way out uh, of the Raptors organization. Now, do you think this is a good, bad move for the Raptors? And if, if you think they should trade him, where do you think he should go? Well, I actually, if I'm the Raptors, I would not trade Kyle Lowry. Remember, I mean, it's easy to forget, but this team was six points away a year ago from going to the conference finals. And I know that's not winning at all. That's not going to the finals or winning the championship. But whenever you can go to the conference finals, your team isn't all that far away. Um, and this team, they don't have a boatload of picks and young players. I don't see this team headed towards a rebuild. Lowry's a little bit of an older player, so theoretically, if you traded him, you'd be looking for some rebuilding pieces, but I think this team is good enough to contend in the East, maybe not win it, and I don't think a rebuild is very attractive without a ton of young players or picks. Evan, the Raptors have an identity crisis. You mentioned last last season they were six points away from reaching the conference finals, right? Their team has only gotten worse. They lost their two big inside presences in uh, Abaka and Marcus Saul. Right now, you're you're the guy who loves to talk about where the teams are in the standings right now. And if the season um, were to progress into the postseason, right now the Raptors would not even be uh, in the top eight seeds. That's scary, right? I certainly expect them to pick it up. However, they're not good enough to contend this year. Uh, I think they need to back out. I think Lowry, uh, I think they need to get what they can get out of him right now because his uh, value is only going to decrease. With that being said, I think they need to show a lot of respect to Lowry. Um, 
they need to uh, show class to him. He's been a loyal player. Uh, a lot of people think he's the best player in franchise history for the Raptors. They need to trade him where he wants to be traded. They need to put him on a contender. So I think a preferred destination for Lowry could be in Los Angeles with Kawhi and Paul George on the Clippers. Now, this was a tough trade to construct because the Clippers gave up their future for Paul George. They signed a ton of players. They have no money left. However, I think they can throw uh, Nicholas Batum, Lou Williams, and future picks. I guess the, the, the Raptors will be trading for like 8th graders or 7th graders at this point. Um, but future picks at the Raptors to grab Kyle Lowry. Um, like I said, Lowry is 34, I think, 35 maybe. His value is not what it used to be. Still an exceptional player. But I think the uh, Raptors will be happy with some expiring contracts such as these. Get them, uh, get them off the books after this year. Free agency is going to be big uh, next year. Hopefully grab one or two guys and then they can look to compete again with Siakam. So maybe not enter a full rebuild, um, but, ha but uh, maybe look to have a core with Siakam, OG Ananobi, Norman Powell, and a few offseason signings and then go back into the postseason looking to contend again. And a second destination that I like Lowry in is uh, with the Sixers, actually. I think you can move Ben Simmons down to power forward. Lowry has championship uh, experience. I don't think a lot of people, uh, a lot of players in the Sixers have championship experience. Um, Danny Green, for sure, and Dwight Howard. But a lot of their rotation players, Ben Simmons, um, Joel Embiid, Tobias Harris, don't have championship experience. So if you have a point guard with good playoff experience, um, a, a poised veteran like Lowry, that can never hurt your team. Uh, so in that move, I think you have to give up Danny Green for contracts, Matisse Thibault, uh, future, two future first-round picks and a pick swap, which may be a little much to get Lowry, but the Sixers are all in this season. They're the best they've been in a while. So uh, I think they need to go for this right now to just put themselves a step further um, in uh, beating a team like the Nets, the, Clip, uh, the Nets, the Lakers, any, any big team they might have to compete with. Yeah, Jake, I definitely like both of those destinations, especially the Clippers. I think that would really elevate them even more into top-tier title contenders if they were able to trade for Kyle Lowry. Uh, my trade package would be the Miami Heat. They give up Kendrick Nunn, Kelly Olynyk, Andre Iguodala, a first-round pick and a second-round pick. It's mainly centered around Nunn and picks. Olynyk and Iguodala are more just to match the salaries, but Toronto would get younger, younger talent with Nunn and the picks. And... The Heat would get an excellent point guard that can play both ways with Kyle Lowry. So, Jake, thank you for joining us. And to all of you listening, thank you for listening. Uh, if you want to do me a big favor, click that subscribe button. Maybe drop your comments down below or leave a like. But I'm Host Evan, and I was joined by Jake, and I'm out. Peace. Peace.